From my experiences working in a mental health hospital, I'm going to give you five powerful advice tips that you can use to help you educate and understand mental health experiences a lot better, people who have mental health issues, but also advice that you can use to transform into your own life. This comes from work with a variety of people. This includes heavy drug users, people who have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, people who have been in for murder, attempted murder, grievous bodily harm, people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder. You name it, I've probably worked with one of these people. I literally just remember just putting my arm out just to say, look, just come down from the bench. And next thing you know, there's a punch being thrown straight to my face. I have to quickly kind of block it with strain and everyone else is coming through and just coming down and just like, it was just a mess. It was just chaotic. I remember when I was applying for it, I just had no idea what to expect. I kind of looked at the job description at the time I was going down. It was a time as well then jobs were very limited. I kind of was gonna at that point where I just wanted to take anything during COVID, anything just to really get out. I saw it and I just read the job description and the things that came with it, the training, that you're gonna be learning a lot of things on the job as well. And to, to be honest, it kind of sparked my interest. I kind of looked at it and went, Actually, this sounds like perfect kind of opportunity for me just to get out, go out my comfort zone, do something different. So I filled in the application process, put it in, had the interview, and next thing you know, I was successful and they offered me the job. Honestly, when I remember walking in my first day, I was proper nervous. I remember just driving in, getting out of the car, walking towards this ward, walking through the door, signed myself in. They basically, I couldn't get keys until I kind of did my probation week as you call it so you kind of have a week of being guided and working alongside someone before you receive a set of keys i remember getting this like pit alarm it's called so it's basically just an alarm that if you feel you're in danger or you're about to be attacked or you're scared or you're concerned about someone's safety it attaches to your belt and then you pull the alarm and it basically rings off like amongst all the wards. They then like show you to your locker and where you put your belongings and stuff. And you're not allowed to take your phone on the ward as well, which is actually quite, taught me a lot of valuable skill lessons. And it learned that I didn't have to work with my phone constantly. And then you can just imagine big white airlock doors and then you press your fob on there, it beeps, you go in, you shut it and then it locks and you have to do it against the other one. I'm not gonna lie, I was shitting it. So I was literally sitting down on the chair and I was just making very basic small talk. So I was trying to act all like the typical fake confidence of, oh, what's your name? Oh, what's your name? Oh, what's your name? Oh, all right, how long have you been on this ward for? And all this sort of stuff. And then there was just the other part of me like, Stephen, you need to just walk out of this room, walk out of this room. But it was good. It really pushed me out of my comfort zone. It was during COVID as well. So I had to sit there, I was wearing like a face mask, had to wear these aprons, had to wear this like massive, helmet face shield. It was almost like I was preparing for a Star Wars movie, really. The first hour that I worked there, I remember the alarm just going off. I started running as well. I was like, oh, I'm gonna join and see what's going on. So I legged it. I ran as well. I, I hadn't been taught anything. I hadn't even been taught restraints. I probably wasn't even allowed to restrain at that time as well. Um, and I didn't, by the way, I kind of just stood there. I observed, I was just there as a means of help if anyone needed it. There was someone literally headbanging just against the wall. Um, and, and that was pretty much it. And I know I sound quite calm about it, but when you've worked in a mental health hospital or within mental health, that is usually quite the norm that you will see. The first few months, first three to six months, it was daunting. I literally remember just coming back after my first shift and while it was crazy and chaos and it was just full throttle, I remember just thinking, what have I done? I needed to sit there, build trust with patients. I needed to sit there and get to talk to them, get to know them better, for them to get to know me better. I think as well, they need that sense of comfort and familiarity with people. Being part of that job and working within that sort of setting, just like everything in life, it all takes time. Over a period of time, around after six months and half a year I'd been in, I definitely started to enjoy it a lot more. I felt more confident in my own abilities my own skill set. I was learning a lot as well. I was verbalizing a lot more with patients and being more confident in my own ability. And it definitely changed my mindset. Also just became more inspiring to patients as well, which I think was really the main part of really why I stayed um, and enjoyed that sort of work that I did with people at that time. It was just more being able to be a role model to people. People kind of looked up to you. People kind of went, this guy's actually, you know, looking after himself, but he's also coming in and looking after us. Like, this is great. And definitely within my time, there was a lot of difficult and challenging situations I had to take. 
there were situations where people would be heavily suicidal and literally would do anything in their willpower to try and kill themselves. There's lots of physical assaults on staff members that I'd seen. There's been assaults on other patients as well. Verbal abuse being sworn at all the time, being told to basically fuck off. I've also seen racism as well from patients to staff members. So honestly, sometimes it's just really a sad set of affairs that you do see over a long period of time. This type of stress can definitely take a negative toll on your well-being, on your health, on your mindset as well. And this is where you really have to start to prioritise yourself, your well-being. To work in this sort of setting, it definitely requires a lot of mental toughness and resilience. To be able to cope with the level of challenging behaviour, challenging people that you see, but also experiencing yourself to a lot of traumatic situations. People are going through the most heavily traumatising and sad times of their own lives. And the things that also they have experienced in their own lives, it definitely is very sad, but it does open your eyes up towards being way more empathetic to people. But when you start to really put yourself out there, you really put a level of care and effort into actually helping someone get better, trust me, the rewards outweigh any form of consequence or any form of negativity because seeing someone change over a period of time is probably the best thing that you can actually see in someone. It definitely taught me a lot of valuable lessons, working alongside your key colleagues, definitely alongside nurses who put a lot of care, effort and their own time just to invest in that good quality health and to help people get better mentally. I became more empathetic, but I also became more assertive. Yeah, the skill sets from being in this sort of environment and pushing myself out of my comfort zone was really fundamental towards me growing, but learning about people and life. I'm going to give you five top advice tips that you can use, which can help just transform your understanding of mental health, mental well-being, from my own experiences, and how you can transform it into your own lives. These were very useful tips. Number one, do not judge a book by its cover. People are like, oh wow, how did you do that? How could you work with someone who murdered someone? How could you work with someone who literally stabbed someone? Like that, how, how can you work with these sorts of people? Trust me, I know what you're thinking. And it's very easy from the outside and the surface of not being involved in these situations to judge. But what you have to understand is these sorts of people have been through extremely traumatic experiences as a child, whether they were adolescents and growing up, they have experienced and seen trauma in their own lives, which caused them to produce the actions because based off the trauma that they had when they was a kid. Honestly, it's a sad state of affairs when you hear about their experiences and backgrounds that they had come from. They were really not given a proper chance to have a good quality life from a young age. You don't really know what everyone goes through behind closed doors until you start speaking and talking and understanding people. I think it's really important to learn to start opening your ears rather than your mouth. You tend to have this focus of wanting to speak and talk all the time. But once you start to open your ears, start to listen to people, start to actually listen to what they're physically saying, you will start to really understand about their life, themselves, and what they have been going through. And from this, you can only start to realise and understand why they're high risk of self-harm, why they're high risk of suicide, why they don't learn to love themselves, why inside of themselves, it's just burdened with absolute trauma. From my experience of dealing with extreme people, you really do see that people just go through a lot of worse experiences than you may have. Just don't judge people. It's easy to spectate from the sidelines and start shouting and being like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But there's a reason behind everyone's actions of why they are doing it something. Honestly, if you put yourself in no shoes, imagine the trauma that someone is experiencing. It's a real sad state of affairs to hear. A key tip, just learn to be a kinder person to someone. Be kinder to yourself, be kinder to people. Just have an open heart to people. Really start to put yourself out there and just be a, just try and be generally good. This kind of tactic of shaming people for what they are, what they're doing is not useful. And it's only just a mirror of your own self and your own insecurities. Definitely having that kindness and compassion towards these sorts of people 
it goes a long way. Trust me, they'll remember you. They will actually know your name. They will literally be so grateful and thankful in the long term future for all the work that you have done. And this can be transformed to your own lives. If someone who you love or someone who you see is struggling, just learn to take a step back and realize if you're in their shoes, what must they be going through? Be kinder, be more compassionate. Learn to put yourself in their, those person's shoes. Help them because remember, they will always be thankful for it. Tip number two, medication versus the natural. Now, the reason I have put this kind of medication versus natural simply is not to bring up the debate of medication is bad. Pharmaceutical companies are exposing you. They want your money. That's a different discussion debate and that by all means go and watch other videos if you feel that's for you. But for my work, own experience of working in mental health hospitals, there's definitely a sad state of reality where there's this kind of over-reliance and focus on medicating people. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, I am not trained in medication. There are definitely cases where medication is needed, but if we can start to incorporate approaches which is actually more beneficial towards actually helping the person's recovery and having this over-reliance on medication and focusing more towards natural lifestyle changes, things within themselves that they can do, we can start to shift away from that medicated approach and start to actually focus towards this idea of focusing on more natural ways that people can get better, especially in medication. Whilst it does definitely have its short-term effects, while it does definitely treat the symptoms as well, it can have a lot of side effects and people do actually respond a lot worse from being on medication. But let's not get into that discussion because that's not what we're here for. I'll give you an example of where a natural situation that I've been in and use a natural form of just conversation, words, have been more beneficial than a sort of situation where I could have been, excuse me, medication, medication, come here, come here. There have been situations where someone's behavior has been increasingly very, very challenging. They're shouting, screaming, high risk of self-harm, okay? Very, very challenging in the way that you can think of it. I've literally approached in a very calm state of mind and manner. I've gone to that person and I've just tried to spend a lot of time with them, reassuring them. They've been crying, upset. And I've just said, look, just, just work with me here. I'm just trying to help you and I'm trying to work with you. Let's just go and discuss what's happened. So you take them from one environment to another, you take them out of that kind of exposure to where they might have been triggered, and then they start to slowly open up, which takes time. They start to talk about how they felt, why they were maybe triggered, why they were reacting angrily or depressed. It's really important just to let them talk. Don't be the talker, but be the listener. Let them express themselves. Then almost like 80% of that problem gets almost resolved. Now that's not saying everything is cured. This is not the, the cured method, but it works in that situation and it can help. All it takes is requiring a little bit of empathy, patience, calm state of mind, reassurance, and just take yourself out of those emotionally stressful situations. Take a step back and just let them talk. Let them express themselves. Let them be. Number three, you as a person are a role model. Honestly, they will see you as an inspiration. They will see you as a role model. They actually look forward to you coming in on that day. Most of the time working in mental health hospitals, they're caged inside. They're not exposed to natural sunlight, natural breathing of fresh air. They're literally stuck between four walls. They literally are being watched constantly by people, observed, observe when they go to the toilet, observe when they go to sleep, followed around every single moment of their life. Trust me, it is very depressing. It is very sad that that is all they experience too. Just imagine you being watched while you go to the toilet. Imagine being watched while you're sleeping. Watched when you go to want to make food 24 seven. That is hard to deal with. You realize that in a sad state of affairs that people become normalized to the mental health system. They almost rely on it. They have not known a life without the system. And it's just a constant circle to their life. They don't see the life that you see, whether that's you having a good interaction with your family members, your loved ones, you go to the cinema, whether you go to a restaurant, they don't experience any of that. They do not see what it's like to have that level of freedom. I realise from my own experiences that building a positive, good attitude for yourself, having a good personality, 
forming good interactions with people, it goes a long way for them to realise that they actually look forward to seeing you and it actually makes positive changes within their day. And you can start to do this in your own real life. You can start to transform your own attitudes, your own behaviours, your own life towards helping other people feel good. Once you start to show this, people almost become like attracted to you naturally. They almost want to see you. They almost want to speak to you. They almost want to be around you. That is a good quality skill to have. Number four, learn to be grateful. When you're working in a mental health hospital, especially as a staff member, you're working lots of big shifts, whether it's in eight to nine hours, 12 hour shifts, numerous days of the week. Trust me, it can be mentally draining, but imagine patients who have been caged there for weeks, months, potentially even years. It really taught me that you need to start counting your blessings in your life. Count the blessings for the people around you, the things you have, the, the interactions that you have, the people, the strangers you come across, the freedom that you have. Trust me, learn to be grateful for it. We've all taken things for granted and we have all had situations where we've been ungrateful. But just learn to reality check yourself again. And if you start to build this skill set within your own mind and your own self, you will live a better quality life. Be grateful that you may have someone out there who actually cares about you. Because the reality is a lot of these people that I've dealt with, sometimes they don't have anyone. They don't have anyone who actually loves or cares for them. The people who then in their childhood who was meant to care and love for them, just abuse that. Number five, prioritize your own well-being. Learning to value your own well-being is one of the most important things that you can do. Honestly, your health is your wealth. When you work in this sort of environment, working shifts, numerous days, numerous nights, not sleeping, not eating properly, it takes its toll on you. When you're working in complex environments, complex situations, where you're dealing with challenging situations, when you're being sworn at, it affects your well-being. I have seen staff work an absurd amount of hours, days. It's almost as if they literally live in the hospital themselves. You need to start valuing your own time and your own recovery. Of course, having resilience is so valuable in itself as a skill for lifelong benefits. Trust me. You need to understand and learn where your limits are. Just ask yourself this, are you getting a good quality, deep level of sleep? Are you eating a nutritious, healthy meal? Are you getting exercise like weight training or cardiovascular exercise? Are you exposing yourself to sunlight? Are you out in nature? Are you building valuable and positive interactions with people? If you're not doing these things, it's just gonna take a toll on your physical health and your own state of mind. Trust me, if this relates, then you know this is affecting you. So start prioritising yourself. Don't neglect yourself. You literally cannot help others if you cannot help yourself. That's the famous saying that everyone hears, but it still relates. Make yourself a priority. Learn when you have to switch off from work. I don't even really encourage people to go home and talk about their work. Just switch it off. Unless you really feel you have to get it off your chest. Sometimes it's just nice to break away from that setting and that scenario. Just go out, chill out, speak about another topic. Just whatever it is, learn to de-stress. This can be transformed into all our areas of life, no matter what work or job we do or what career we do. Whether you love your job, whether you hate your job, whether you're just even in between about your job, it will definitely have points on our journey where it will get to us. And you have to start taking ownership over your own self and prioritise yourself. I hope this video did provide some useful insights and if you have any discussions, if it provided some form of inspiration, please just leave a comment uh, in the comment. Anything you want to discuss, just put it in. Take care guys.